All right, we've pushed everything on the bench aside for a bit because we're going to do a project with electronics. All right, so here's what's up. I want to build a Kovac speech thing. Basically, back in the 80s, some company called Kovac came up with a way to get audio out of a computer without adding any complex, expensive hardware to it. Back in the 80s, PCs in particular had no sound card to speak of. They didn't have a way of producing PCM audio, so arbitrary waveforms were totally out of the question. There were sound cards, but those sound cards were, at best, usually just FM synthesizers. FM, while it was a very remarkable type of synthesis, didn't produce anything, anything like natural sound. It produced some interesting synthetic bell sounds and could produce noise, but it couldn't really do anything resembling real sound effects. So if you wanted something that sounded like a voice, you were never going to get it out of FM. Other than that, the PC in particular, the IBM PC, had nothing more than the PC speaker, which could produce a beep of different frequencies, and that was it. There were a couple companies that went so far as to try modulating the PC speaker beep frequency at very high frequency in order to get something approaching PCM audio out of it, and some of them had success, but it was never accepted in everyday software. So. Long story short, if you wanted sound in 1989, you could just go fuck yourself. It wasn't going to happen. So Kovacs, and I don't know the whole story behind this, because what research I've done has not turned up a whole lot, but apparently they made speech synthesizer software, and their technique for getting people sound cards without having to sell them sound cards was to make this thing. Now, I'm going to put an image of it up on the screen so you can see what it looked like from the outside. The pictures online aren't very good, but you can probably tell that it's fairly cheap. You can also see it plugs into the parallel port, and that's very interesting because basically any PC of the time had a parallel port, so this company could rely on that. So there isn't really great history on what Kovacs was doing, but they did produce this phenomenon. So what this is, if you speak electronics at all, should be fairly self-evident. Take a look. It's in a book reading. So this is what's called a resistor ladder, and I'll admit that I don't really understand how it works. I mean, I sort of get it, but uh, I didn't go to school for EE. But the idea is this. The, this is the parallel port. This is a 30 cent connector. And then these are resistors, which are a couple of cents a piece if you're doing things right. Um, and, and then more resistors. So, you know, maybe a dollar of components here. And then a, a couple of capacitors just to couple to the output. The, the idea is that this is all passive components. There's no transistors in here. There's no integrated circuits. There's no intelligence. This is nothing more than just resistors plugged into your parallel port. And with this and the right software, you can produce bad but usable audio. Now, what's great about this is because these are so cheap and because this is so simple, because there's no integrated circuits, there's no digital logic, there's no intelligence to this, people made these in scads back in the 80s and 90s. Apparently, this is even a big thing in Japan. I think the MSX is what I was reading. Uh, people did this with as well. And the reason is just because getting PCM audio at the time was a huge, huge expense if it was possible at all. For some reason, connecting DACs to computers back then just was not popular. So if you wanted sound, you could build something like this, or I guess you could go to hell. So unfortunately, there aren't a lot of Kovac speech things left in the world, as far as I can tell. Uh, they, they aren't easy to acquire, apparently. So not only that, but apparently the tradition of the thing is to build your own. So like a lightsaber, I think I'd better do it. So I've got all the implements I need, pliers, clippers, solder, soldering iron, and the very basic components I need. Here's the bill of materials. 15k ohm resistors, 7.5k ohm resistors, DB25 connector, the head for the DB25 connector. And that's it. That should be all we need. Now, of course, the original Kovac speech thing probably had a printed circuit board inside, but I'm going to attempt to do this using a method called dead bug wiring. That's where I'm going to just use the components themselves and the leads that are built into them. I'm going to solder them onto each other and I'm just going to try and make this as compact as possible. The reason for that is basically I can't make printed circuit boards, and trying to figure out how to convert this schematic into something made with wires floating around in space is very, very hard. However, I think that if I just take this schematic and translate it directly into physical space, I think I can make this, and I think it'll be very, very easy compared to trying to make my own circuit that's equivalent to this logically, but is much easier to understand. 
I'd rather have something that's hard to understand but works because all this is is a batch of resistors. I don't want to put much thought into it. Now, DB25 connectors come in several styles. This is a male DB25, as in it has the pins sticking out here. And on the back side, this has what are called solder cups. So you can see here that these brass or gold-plated pins or whatever they are, are hollow. They've got little cups here. And the idea is that you can actually seat a conductor, a wire, or the lead of a component into them. And they'll actually sort of hang there while you apply solder to them and it gives plenty of surface area for the solder to stick to. Now because this is so fiddly, I'm going to go ahead and use helping hands. These aren't for everyone, but for me, I find them indispensable. A lot of people find them so irritating to work with that they, they'd just rather just do it on the surface of the table, and I can't blame them for that because figuring out the specifics of how to get this to match what you're doing uh, can be really weird. This schematic here has a bunch of stuff going on right here in the middle. Oh, there's all this stuff going on here, all these things. It, it's upsetting. It, if you look at it, you're like, well, um, uh, this can I, okay, okay, hey, don't look at it, okay? Look at that part. Just look at this, okay? You can see what's going on here. I mean, if you, if you electronics at all, and if you don't, you probably still can. All you're doing is you're taking one side of eight resistors, and you're soldering each one of them, to one of these pins. You can do that, right? Don't worry about any of this. Do that later. Okay? We're just going to solder these eight pins. We're going to solder these eight resistors to these eight pins. And then everything else we'll do afterwards. Seven, eight, nine. Nine because the bottom one goes to ground. And by the way, ground, if you're not familiar, means chassis. So the outside here, this is ground. So you could just solder onto the outside, the, the metal case of this thing. Pin 19 is ground. So all we have to do is uh, find pin 19, and we're going to attach this resistor there. This is a shorthand that's used in schematics, where the thing labeled ground is just distributed all around in the schematic with no regard to where it is in physical space. So this spot, this spot, and this spot are all ground. It's OK. Okay, now here's the scariest thing we're going to do. We're going to ruin these. We're going to take this whole batch of resistors and we're going to clip all the leads off on one side. Not all of them, mind you. Not technically. We're going to clip them real short. Just short enough that they'll go right into the jack, right into the solder cup and no, no deeper. And the reason for that is that we're dead bugging this, so we need these to fit inside of the DB25 shell. So I'm going to cut this about that long. About that long. Okay? I've never done this before, but I'm pretty sure it's about as long as I need it to be. I'm going to hold it up and cut it to the same length. I'm not too worried about this, because if I get it wrong, I've got 99 more, 91 more to try with. I can mess it up. I need to get my sponge wet. Sponge is wet. Station on. I have to suggest, by the way, if you don't have a temperature controlled station, if you can rustle up the money for one, I'm telling you, it changes the world of soldering completely. So I'm going to use a technique that some might consider sort of uncouth. Uh, I'm going to put solder in the cup first, and then I'm going to add the... I'm going to put solder in the cup first, and then I'm going to put the resistor in. This means I'm going to get a relatively cold joint, but for this, it doesn't matter because there won't really be any strain on it. From my diagram here, it looks like the first pin I'm going to do is going to be pin 9, right in the middle. And on this guy, on this connector, the pins are actually labeled. It's real small, but they are in there. So pin 9 is going to be 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, right there. Now, I'm going to apply the tip not to the solder, but underneath on the bottom of the cup. Try and get as much of the tip touching the cup as possible to transfer the maximum amount of heat. We want to get the cup hot because if we don't, none of the solder will bond to the cup. And if that happens, then it is likely to just break off at some later date randomly. We want to get the 
We want to get the cup kind of hot. There we go. Okay, starting to melt. Tip really wants to slide off. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay, there we go. There was a moment where you saw this sort of bulged, and then whoop, it just became concave. That means that it bonded. That means it's stuck to the cup now. So we're good. Now I'm going to work my way over all the way to pin two. I'm actually going to push my heat up just a little bit because that was a little cold. This, uh, this is about 745 degrees. Uh, it's a little inappropriate for the solder directly, but because we're going through the cup, it'll, it'll be okay. There we go. Much quicker. Fantastic. Okay, here we are. I'm going to get my resistor here, and what I'm actually going to do is just bend it. I'm going to bend it like that, which will allow me to angle it in without a lot of effort. Now, this isn't the maybe the best way to do this, but if you can wrangle it with pliers, you'll get a better grip because your fingers are sausage-like compared to that little tiny wire. But this is a lot quicker and a lot more wieldy. So I'm going to try and install resistor in pin 19. Okay. All right. And we're frozen. All right. There it is. Okay. Repeat for the rest. So those are all frozen. They look like a mess right now, but I think we can make some sense of it. So we have our initial connections. All these are hooked up. Now the next thing that needs to happen is we need to connect all of these ones. Now what we notice is each of these connects straight through to each of these. And then there's a bridge between them. So let's try and trace this out. So. If we were to install this resistor, we would solder it directly to the end of this resistor's lead. Then we would take the other side of that resistor and we'd tie it in to the one above it, which is also connected here. So here's what we do. Break it down. We have all these installed and we have all these installed straight through to one another. Let's do that. Then, once we've done that, we're going to curl each of these legs over and tie it into the joint that we made between these two resistors. And in that way, we're not going to beat ourselves up trying to do all of this at the same time. Put another pack of resistors here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm really bad with uh, basic counting. I, I actually have to count stuff out out loud a lot of the time to be sure I'm getting the number that I think I am. Um, because I'm just really bad about it. Uh, I don't know what to say. Um, you know, it's a disability, I guess. Uh, I just never got very good at counting things rapidly. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each one of these resistors, 
and we're going to solder it to each one of those resistors. And to do that, we need to get the ends to connect to one another. I'm going to take this resistor, and I'm going to clip it like that. And then I'm going to take this and roll it into a hook. It's a real tight hook, almost no space. Now we're going to take these and we're going to do the same thing. Clip it and roll it. Oops, let's try that again. Right the tip and then roll it over like that. I'm going to go ahead and clip each one of the rest of these at once because now that I've rolled that one I feel pretty confident about doing the rest. I'm going to make a spiral out of it. It is a little hard to do this in close quarters. I guess if I had to do it again, I'd probably roll these over before I installed them. Alright, those are all done. Just need to get this one now. Alright, now that one's done. Cool. Gently bend those back down. Now, something I want to point out is that when I, when I assemble all this, these may have a tendency to run into one another. I'm going to solve that by filling this with hot glue. Um, I'm going to get them all in a comfortable position, and I'm just going to hot glue the shit out of them. Uh, that's basically a technique called potting. Uh, it's used in marine and military equipment a lot. Uh, you're supposed to do it using potting compound, using some sort of standard polymer, uh, but uh, I'm just going to do it with hot glue because hot glue is cheap, and it fills spaces, and I already know how to work with it. All right, so now I need to do the rest of these. I need to get all these bent up now. So how am I going to solder these in midair? I'm going to cheat. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put solder blobs on the end of each one of these. It's not the most ideal way to do solder joints because you'll get cold joints but for this part of it I think it'd be made an error I've realized um, this resistor here this one on the bottom on pin 19 I wasn't supposed to clip the end because this doesn't get a second resistor so I actually need to pull that out and replace it that's okay I'll just pull it out and replace it remember I got spares you always want to order extra for a project especially if you haven't done it before or if it's an experiment okay no harm done, we're fixed. Now let's start hooking on the 7.5K ohm resistors. absolutely clear this is a terrible solder job this don't do this unless you're doing this this is not the way this should be done but it'll work it'll work fine for what we're doing again don't get intimidated let's do something simple let's start at the very bottom here's resistor 1 a 15k which we attached to ground which is pin 19 so that's that's this resistor right here then we want to take the other side of it and connect it to the joint between the one that's on two, pin two and the other resistor that's coming out the other side of that one. This is pin two and this is the joint for pin two. So we're gonna take this lead, we're just gonna bring it up 
and around. Okay, it might be hard to tell, but the resistor on the bottom is now fed into the nexus between these two. So now there's a joint with all three. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply tension to this one so it doesn't fall apart. And then I'm going to heat this up so that the solder flows over all three. Next, we need to repeat that process with each of the other resistors. Now that we've connected this to this nexus, we see the output from this comes up and connects between these ones. So we just repeat the process. This is super tedious. You're in the tedium zone because look how close all this is. This is going to be hard to get right. It's going to be hard to avoid shorts. That's always the case with dead bug construction. But look how little time we spent on this. It, you know, it's been an hour since I started this project because I was explaining things and everything, but the amount of time I spent on building this, well, I'll check once I've finished recording, but I'll bet it's been no more than 20 minutes. I didn't have to make a circuit board. I didn't have to design any wiring. I just built exactly what was on the paper straight on the connector. We're just going to knit this. We're going to take, take this lead. We're going to feed it up right through the middle of the one next to it. There it goes. Okay. Okay, that's done. This first one here made quite a dip, but the rest are going to be a little easier. They're going straight over instead of having to go under. So, Take this guy, just bend it back, just like it shows on the schematic. You no, know, if we do this, the other one's going to fall down. Yep. Let's pull it back up. Okay. Done. All right, let's go ahead and clip that, clean it up. That's it. Technically, we've built a Kovac speech thing. Uh, this is all it would take. Uh, we could hook this up right now and it would probably work. Um, but there's a little more to do to make this perfect. So this lead here is the output. But uh, this recommends a coupling capacitor. And I'm not quite sure what this means. SV12, SV11. I'm going to go look at another schematic and figure out what those correspond to. All right, in other diagrams I've found, there simply is no capacitor there. So I'm just going to go ahead and hook it up. It won't break anything. Let's plug this in, see if it works.
Hold on. So first things first, I gotta get something on here that can actually talk to this type of sound device. So I'm gonna boot into Windows and I'm gonna push a few pieces of software on here from some shareware collection that have Disney Sound Source or Kovac Speech Thing support. Here we go. Speech Thing! Uh, put port one, uh, maximum, okay. Let's give this a shot. Oh, fuck me sideways. Th that's coming out of the parallel port. No way. That sounds about a billion times better than I expected. Sounds great! I worry that you can't hear this clearly because my microphone is not near where it's coming out, so I'm gonna move the mic so you can hear it. Absolutely unbelievable. I just, I cannot believe that this works. I mean, I get it. I understand all the principles involved, but at the same time, I just, I can't believe that's coming out of the printer port. I mean, it's a DAC. It's, it's a digital analog converter. I understand how a resistor ladder DAC works, but this is still very strange to fathom. The final stage of this project is to put this thing into a chassis and get a connector on it. For the connector, I've got this eighth inch jack that I found in a box. This is a monaural output, which is perfect because this thing is monaural. So let's go ahead and get this into a chassis. This is a basic plastic chassis. Wow, okay. So the way the jack screws on here work, they use flat heads. Um, I'm very sorry to the person, the very kind person who I'm sending this to. I didn't know this was so bad. But uh, for what it's worth, this is very 80s style. So this goes in here. And there's just enough room. See, this doesn't quite fit. So we need to make some adjustments. First, this has to come in like that. Okay. And then everything needs to sort of squeeze over some. Kind of push everything. I'm going to do something really cheap. I'm actually going to bring this up here into that corner. Feed the output wire around there. Okay. Think. I think I got it. Now I'm not going to pot this. I'm not going to fill this with glue until I've confirmed that it's working properly. It would just be very silly for me to do that. All the other pins up here are also grounds, so we're just going to go ahead and get some solder in here. There we go. Now the last thing to do is just to get our signal. Oops. 
And to do that, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pull this up. I'm gonna perform inline splice. Same as I did with everything else. Okay, I'm just gonna fold that up right in there. So it looks like this strain relief won't actually capture this wire. I'm just gonna hot glue the whole damn thing, call it good. So for now, let's go ahead and drop the other part of the shell on here. Yeah, it's doing it. It's uh, only in one ear, and it's quiet, but that's because I'm using, you know, probably high impedance headphones. These are pretty high end, and uh, I'm just getting one channel because it's a mono jack with a stereo plug in it, but it's definitely working. I got this super prissy DeWalt glue gun. It wasn't very expensive. Like, I think it was like $15 or something. I don't know if it's any better than any other glue gun, but it looks so cool makes my inner eight-year-old just completely scream in joy. Look at this blaster. Yeah. I know, I know, it's so upsetting. Hot glue, right? It, it just makes you so mad. But it has applications. I need you to trust me on this. There are reasons to use hot glue. I mean, look. If this were some $6,500 piece of gear, if this were some vintage piece of equipment, if this were something valuable and rare, doing this would be sacrilegious. But it's not. I built this for $2. Relax. Everything's going to be okay. Take a quick selfie of the apparatus. And we're actually going to just go ahead and just shoot some in the back here. Okay. There we go. That's finished product. There we go. A custom product made by Gravis.